Well, good evening and uh, welcome to another Wednesday's Word. I guess really the last Wednesday's Word of 2020. And it's uh, good that you're tuning in and uh, we pray that uh, today's lesson uh, will be a blessing to you and touch your life. Uh, if you have your Bibles, we're still in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We'll finish that up uh, on this devotional. And so uh, you can go ahead and turn there. Uh, our series has been Love in Action as we look at all those characteristics of love. And uh, let me just kind of recap where we've covered. Uh, love is patient. Love is kind. And is not jealous. Love does not brag. Is not arrogant. Does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Does not take into account a wrong suffered does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things. And so now we're in uh, verse 7, uh, continuing in verse 7 to pick up where we left off, that love endures all things. Uh, that is a really a military term that has to do with how military invasion will take a hill or mountain or position at all costs. Uh, it doesn't matter what it was going to cost in lives or ammunition or possessions, that they're going to take it, they're going to hold it, that military position, uh, at all costs. And love will endure whatever the cost. It takes those actions, it makes those steps to continue to endure, to love the person that they're choosing to love, whether it's a spouse, a friend, a co-worker, even an enemy, they're going to do that. Uh, you know, Jesus demonstrated that on the cross. He endured. I remember even when they were arresting him, he said, I could call 12 legions of an uh, angels. That's 72,000 angels. That's a lot of angels that he could call. So it wasn't a matter that uh, he didn't have the power and in the, in the resources that are available to uh, not go to the cross. He chose to. He endured all that suffering, all that agony, all that pain and the death on the cross for us because he loved us. That was amazing that he endured that way. Uh, matter of fact, it was uh, Robinson and Plumer. Uh, they stated this uh, statement that way. When hopes are repeatedly disappointed, it will, it meaning love, still courageously waits. No matter what happens, it endures, it waits, it, it puts up with because that's what love does when we choose to love that way in the midst of it. It was Stephen as well in Acts 7, 60. It says, Then falling on his knees, that was Stephen, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. Oh, he endured all the people stoning him to death for really no, really no reason. He hadn't done anything to deserve that. He was just following Christ. And he would tell them, don't lay this charge to them. Don't lay this sin to their charge. That they, you know, that's amazing that he, his love would endure even his enemies that way is amazing. And that's what our love should do. It should endure all things. It can put up with it. Why? Because we love the other person. In verse 8, it starts out by saying, love never fails. Uh, it never ends. It didn't end in the Old Testament. It didn't end in the New Testament. It won't end in the rapture. It won't end in the tribulation. It won't end in the millennium. And it won't end in eternity. Love never fails when we choose to love that way. Uh, matter of fact, Songs of Solomon 8, 7 says, Many waters cannot quench love, nor will rivers overflow it. If a man were to give all the riches of his house for love, it would be utterly despised. You know, that's what love does. It just, it'll never fail. You know, many people when uh, they come in for counseling, special, especially couples, will make that statement, I don't love them anymore. Well, the correction to that is start or restart because love is an action and it never fails. You say, well, the person, well, I've failed. I, I, they've said, I, I, it must have because I don't love them anymore. Well, what they're saying is they don't have any feelings or emotions. Uh, their, their will is kind of just given up into their own emotions. But if they choose through their will to say, you know what? I don't feel like loving them. I don't feel like doing anything for them. Matter of fact, 
the feelings I have are only feelings of hate. But I'm going to choose to take the action to love because true love never fails. John 13, 1 says, Having loved his own, that's Jesus, who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And that end is not necessarily the end of time, which he did, but it's, it's, it's to the end, meaning to its perfection. He loved his disciples to perfection, which in its perfection, he loved them to the end of time because his love never failed. That's how his perfect love was demonstrated, not only in great sacrifice, not only in endurance, but in also never failing. And praise the Lord that God's love never fails for us. Boy, do we give him plenty of opportunity to not love us, but it's his grace that initially loved us. It's his grace that continues to love us, even in the midst of our failures, even in the midst of our disappointments where we fail the Lord or we fall, but we get back up and he, his love has never failed us and never will fail us. He keeps on loving. And how we are to take that example to others to be able to love them that way without fail. I know people give us many reasons that we would want to fail to love them back. They disappoint us. They don't measure up maybe to our expectations. They, they mess up. But can't we show that kind of love to them that Christ showed to us where our love for them would never fail as well? It's a description of Christ's love and it will never fail even throughout eternity love never fails and then in verse 8 it says but if there are gifts of prophecy they will be done away and if there are tongues they will cease and if there is knowledge it will be done away we won't go into all the the Greek there because each one of those has to do with a little separate thing but basically all these gifts they're going to come to an end Especially when we get to eternity, that's really what we're going to be looking at. Uh, there won't be needs of those gifts. They're going to be done away. They, we won't be practicing many of those gifts, if, if any, uh, in eternity. And then in verse 9, For we know in part, and we also prophesy in part. Meaning right now, our knowledge is limited. Uh, our, what we know and what we can do and what we say uh, we're limited, and that doesn't limit us from studying the Scripture. You're tuning in today for more uh, wisdom, direction, and guidance from the Scripture uh, because we want to be all we can be. We want to be as mature as we can be. We want to know as much as we can know about the Scripture, but it's always going to be limited on this side of heaven. Uh, it's going to be in part. But in verse 10, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. Well, what is the perfect? Well, that's, that's the big question. If you study a lot of commentaries, theologians, pastors, you're going to get some disagreement. Some say it's spiritual maturity is the, the key. Some of it say it's the scriptures. But if you look at all the things that the commentaries say that it could be, usually each one of those has a, a fault to where it won't, it's not that. But the thing that fits in best, I believe, is that perfect is eternity. When we see Christ, I believe it's backed up in the, in the verses that we're going to look at after this, is that perfect is eternity. When the perfect comes, the partial, all that limits, all those imperfections, sin, all that's going to be just done away. And even the gifts will, will be there face to face. And Paul emphasizes this again in verse 11. He said, when I was a child, I used to speak as a child. Think as a child, reason as a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. I believe what he's saying here is an illustration of his spiritual life. You know, he's, he was a young boy, you know, as he became a new believer, and then he, he grew. Uh, the illustration is in the he Hebrew culture, in the Jewish culture, the, uh, a boy was a boy till his bar mitzvah. And then at that exact moment, he became, in their eyes, an adult. He wasn't a boy anymore. Just instantaneously, they would recognize him from the day before as a boy to that day on the bar mitzvah as an adult. It just happened. And, and he said, once I did become an adult, I put away all those childish things. And, and that's what he's looking at here. He's looking at when we see Jesus, when we're in eternity, when we're blessed with being with the Lord, 
uh, all those other things we put away. We're, we're there to get the full knowledge, the full wisdom. Why? Because we're with him face to face. And that's also backed up in verse 12. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully just as I am fully known. He was talking about in a mirror dimly back in Corinth. They had bronze mirrors. They didn't have the mirror material like we have today, which we can see so clearly. They were pieces of metal, and you had to kind of turn it different ways to get a good look at yourself in the mirror. It was, it was hard to see. You had to really strain with these metal mirrors. And that's what we are today. We, we see things. We study. We read the scriptures. We learn. We grow. But to some extent, it's always going to be some limit to that. But when we see him face to face, oh my goodness, when we're there face to face with Jesus, wow, that, that just overwhelms me. Then things are going to be different. We're going to see and we're going to know as we are known. We'll have that full knowledge that we've all longed for, and that we all should still long for, but it's going to be complete then, and it's going to be a glorious day. Matter of fact, even wanting to see the Lord is something that's, that others have done. Remember Moses in Exodus 33, 18, I'm going to read it. Then Moses said, I pray you show me your glory. He asked God to show him his glory, and he said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you. And will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And show compassion on whom I'll show compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face. For no man can see me and live. Then the Lord said, behold, there's a place by me. And you shall stand there on the rock. And it will come about while my glory is passing by. That I will put you in the cleft of the rock. And cover you with my hand until I pass by. Then I will make my hand, take my hand away and you will see my back, but my face shall not be seen. You know, I'm reminded of that hymn, He Hideth Me in the Cleft of the Rock, or He Hideth My Soul is the name of the uh, hymn. And that main chorus there says, He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land he hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. Boy, he loves us with an unfailing love. And just as Moses wanted to see God's glory, he saw it partially. Uh, he did see the glory. He didn't see God's face. But here in eternity, Moses and all of us who, who have trusted in Christ will be able to see him face to face. And then that chapter ends up with this verse. But now faith, hope, love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. You see, when we're there with Christ, we really won't need faith because we're going to be seeing everything by our sight. You know, we, we, we always, we preach here, live by faith, not by sight, but there we're going to see and so faith is not the big issue. And then hope, what is to hope for? We've got all the fulfillment of everything we've, we've been hoping for, which will be received in eternity. And so hope won't be the main thing, but you know what will stay the main thing? Love. Not hope, not faith, but he says the greatest is love. Why? Because love will never fail That'll last all throughout eternity and be the preeminent importance where these others have been important to us, but love will just continue on. The one thing that we're wanting to practice now is love is the one thing that'll go all through eternity and where he says, and the greatest of all these things he's listed, the greatest is love. For us to continue on in loving others now, loving the Lord now, and seeing in these verses how we can love the Lord even better than we did before. And one reason I believe that's evident is 1 John 4, 8. God is love. God is love. And so we're going to be living with God and we'll be living with love. And we should show that love now 
through our lives to others and to the Lord as we have whatever days we have left in this life to do. So I hope you've enjoyed the series on love in action. Well, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you that we're going to see you face to face in eternity, Lord. Oh, so much we look forward to, Lord, in having that day come. And Father, as we know that love is the most preeminent thing, Lord, may we practice it now more and more. We, may we practice it the way we've learned it here, to be able to love the way you loved us and to be able to see these practical ways that we can love others better. And so, Father, we thank you for leaving us this word and leaving us how we can love better. And, Lord, through the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, give us the strength and show us ways that we're not loving the way we should, the way the Scripture here in 1 Corinthians have told us, so that we can make those changes and we can be more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I hope you enjoyed this series. That wraps us up, 1 Corinthians 13, love in action. So I encourage you to just continue to practice these principles in the days and weeks and months ahead until we see him face to face. So praise the Lord. I wanted to, on behalf of the church and um, all the pastors and staff, I wanted to wish you a, a happy new year. Uh, it's coming up in just a few days, so I hope you have a great uh New Year's, and we look forward to all God's going to do, uh, what he's been doing in 2020 and what he's going to do in 2021. So I hope you and your family have a happy new year. God bless you. Pray for you. Love you. And look forward to seeing you next time. God bless.